down south. Let's try that again. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We are here today as a coalition of organizations because there is a working group that's going to be happening here today called the Working Group to Focus on Police Involved Deadly Force Encounters in Minnesota. This working group, which was con convened by um, Keith Ellison and is co chaired by John Harrington, the Public Safety Commissioner, the purpose of this is purportedly to address police accountability. But with the structure, and the composition of this work group, there is no possibility that this work group is in any way going to address police accountability. There are no members of any families who have been essentially screwed over by the BCA. There are no members of the disability community. And what we know about the disability community is that fully 50% of people who are killed at the hands of police are um, dealing with a mental health crisis at the time. There are not any members of the Latino community, no Native American members of the community. There are no uh, members of the mom community, and there are no police accountability activists on this committee at all. How do they expect to solve a huge problem of police killings when you don't even have the right people at the table? And to make it more insulting to the community, the process itself is flawed. They will spend today listening to panels of so-called experts. Experts in what? We don't really know, because they didn't pick anybody who actually does this work to give any testimony whatsoever. And so they're going to have this process. The public will get a couple of words in edgewise uh, at the very, very end of the day. This is disgraceful, this is unacceptable, and we are not gonna be ignored. So with that, I would like to call up Denny Aiden, with the Isaac Aiden family. I would like to introduce myself. My full name is Benjamin Aiden. Uh, I'm the older brother of Isaac Aiden. Uh, first and foremost, I just want to say we're here, me and my family are here to stand in support with all our families and victims of police brutality. And we're also here to speak up for those who couldn't make it here. As Michelle mentioned, we're here to question the frequency of the Keith Ellison working group. Because if you guys don't know, my brother was shot and killed July 2nd by seven police officers in Eakin, Minnesota. And this is still an ongoing investigation. We haven't heard anything that's been over a month. They had no real reason to kill my brother. There's no way to justify this, and we're being denied even public information. We're not allowed to get the personnel files of any officers. Eakin was the only uh, department that supplied us any information at all. So for Keith Ellison to be hosting this working group and to say he's having members of the community being represented is just incorrect. And it's also a disrespect to all the families here in Minnesota who Keith Ellison is speaking on behalf of and not even inviting to this event. So we're really here today to make sure our voices are heard and to try to get new information. Right now, um, all the officers who shot and killed my brother back on the job. We were told that paid administrative leave is only three days. So these people haven't been found innocent or guilty yet, and they're still out on the streets. Two of the five officers who killed my brother previously killed other people. So we have a ton of officers who their first instinct is to shoot. Without any mental health evaluation, they're back on the job pulling people over. And I don't know why the situation is not being addressed. I don't know why they're not even on paid administrative leave until this investigation is over. But today we're here to stand in support with all the families and just make sure our voices are heard because this is just disrespect what Keith Nelson is doing. Next we will hear from Bridget Sayana, who is a, an advocate and um, disability rights person. She is somebody who should have been on this committee. Mental health, and this is 
is also cross-race, GLBTQ, and many other identities. So this is a very intersectional issue. Um, primarily, um, it's people of color and disabled folks and generally um, marginalized and vulnerable people who are affected by this issue. Tragically, many of the stories of disabled people being brutalized by police don't make it into public consciousness because of the level of ableism and the disrespect of our human rights. We are dehumanized. Many people already think that we don't deserve to live. According to research, police violence against an individual with a disability is often a result of a lack of understanding and awareness. So some examples would be if a person is deaf, they may, be, they may appear to be ignoring an officer's demands or commands. An individual with an intellectual or dis developmental disability may not process officer commands quickly enough and may appear to be non-compliant. An individual with autism or an autistic person may flee or walk away from an officer. People with a sensory disorder may become violent if touched due to a sensory defensiveness that provokes fight or flight response. There is plenty of research on how black, brown, indigenous, disabled, queer, gay, transgender, and other people are perceived and responded to by police. They are seen as more dangerous, less compliant, and a threat. There is a lack of awareness of disability and its intersectionality with communities of color. This leads to excessive force, brutality, and unnecessary incarceration. We are asking the community to take this seriously and demand accountability for the way that our community members are being treated by the police. It will take community voices, stories of those that are affected, and measures to change these practices. It needs to be community-led, and the way that looks is not having the police be the ones to, again, control the narrative. Yes. Yes. Any effort needs to be grassroots, and we are here today because this working group is not structured in such a way that progress can be made. We need to disassemble this flawed working group and empower the community and people who have been impacted to be the voice of a movement to reform policing. And the only way that we can truly begin to implement solutions that decrease police shootings. Thank you. Next up is Tashira Garraway, who lost her significant other to the St. Paul Police Department. So she is one of the voices of experts, not the people that are in this room right now. She is one of the true voices of experts. So my son's father, uh, the anniversary of his murder by the St. Paul police is this upcoming Monday, August 19th, which was the worst day of my entire life. 33 years old, and that was the worst day of my life. Um, I just, and it's hard for me not to get emotional standing here because knowing that his anniversary of the murder was, is Monday, and I just seen the chief of police walk by, Chief Harrelton, who was the chief of police when my son's father was beat. He was beat brutally behind the midway, and then they threw his body in the dumpster. Uh, once they was finished with his body. Um, the dump truck came and picked up the, the recycling and the line waste management came to pick up the dump truck not knowing that it was a body in it and drove it out to Amber Grove Heights and he came through on the flatbed with the rest of the recycling material. So I have pictures of my son's father body beaten all over, his skull is busted in half, his, uh, you can see that he had the handcuffs on when they beat him. Uh, he had dog bites all over his body. Uh, they followed and harassed me and his mother after they murdered Justin. They drove up and down the street at, at the funeral, uh, sat outside my home, followed me to the store with my three-year-old son. Now, I want you guys to picture this story. Someone murders your son or murders the father of your son because it was me and his mother together. Then after they murder your child, then they follow you and sit outside while your other, he was the oldest, Justin was the oldest of five kids. So they sat outside while his little brothers and sisters played. They followed the mother of his child as I would come outside with my three-year-old son at that time to, and 
wave at me, do certain things to let me know I know who you are. So this is what I've had to live with since August 19, 2009. I knew when they murdered Justin that this had been happening and that it was gonna continue to keep happening. At that time, I tried to tell people about my story. Hardly anyone believed me because at that time, it was before Fernando Castile, it was before Jamar Clark, it was before a lot of the stories that are coming out. So no one hardly believed me. I couldn't get attorneys to take the case. I, I just, I couldn't get anybody to help me. Um, now it's coming out more because we, the, they, they, they just keep doing it. Uh, there is so many other families besides the families that that is here today. There is so many other families out in St. Paul, Minneapolis, all the other surrounding areas that are suffering from police brutality. But once they murder our loved ones, what they do is they harass us. What they do is they do everything in their power to cover up the stories. What they do is they do everything in their power to keep us silent. Well, we cannot continue to suffer in silence because we are family, we love our families like they love their families. We love our loved ones like they love their loved ones. We all have people that we love and we did not deserve to go through what we're going through. The people that were murdered at the hands of the police did not deserve that. We are human beings just like you and we don't, no one deserves to be in a garbage can. But yet, that is where the St. Paul police put my son's father, and I have been afraid for my own life and afraid to speak out, but I can no longer suffer in silence. I have a 13-year-old son that does not have a father because of the St. Paul police. There is nothing that he did to deserve to be in the garbage can. So I just wanted to get out today to tell my story, to tell the truth, the truth, because they will put a different story in the media. They will put a different story on the news. They, they will do everything to cover up hundreds of murders since the year 2000. Thank you so much, and God bless. We're now gonna hear from Abby Blevins. She's the sister of Thurman Blevins, who was killed by the Minneapolis Police Department on the north side. As he ran away, he was gunned down in his back um, a year ago, a little over a year ago. So, Abby, come on up. Hello, my name is Abby. Um, I'm the sister of uh, June Blevins. He was killed on uh, June 23rd of 2018. He was killed on um, June 23rd of 2018 uh, by Officer Smith and Officer Kelly. Um, basically what I wanted to touch on was all the aspects of uh, what had happened that day. I feel that the police need way more training in how to deal with certain situations, especially involving people out here in our community. I feel that um, they don't really think about the situations before they approach them. I feel they just jump out with intentions just to kill. And with them getting away with it so much, you know, this is continuously going on day in and day out. And I feel if they be held accountable, I feel like, you know, a lot of this will definitely, you know, calm down a lot. And that's why I'm here today to hopefully get a chance to speak to Keith Ellison whoever else is in there about this situation as well is holding these uh, cops accountable for what they're doing out here. You know, being prosecuted, being fired, you know, all that stuff that plays a part with them killing, you know, a lot of innocent people out here. And I just wanted to uh, say a couple words right now. Thank you. We're gonna hear briefly from Kim Handy Jones, who uh, drove all the way here from Chicago to be here this morning. Her son, Cordell Handy, was killed by the St. Paul police a little over a year ago. Not my 
my son's ending. I'm sick and tired of police brutalizing, weaponizing, demonizing, and victimizing and criminalizing our children. It needs to stop. And it needs to come to a win. None of my children deserve to be dead. They didn't have to die. But this is what happens when you're with cops that don't have no humanity, no empathy, no sympathy. And they're not going to keep doing it on our watch. Nothing about us without us. 